Hello and welcome back to World War Two TV. It's been a bit, a bit of a break, but I'm glad to be back. And we've got quite a lot of new subscribers who've signed up over the last few weeks. So a little bit of housekeeping before we get on with today's show. So if you are new to World War Two TV, I'm Paul Woodadge, Normandy Battlefield Guide. I live here in France. Obviously, I'm British by birth, but I live in France. If you are new to the channel, make sure you become a subscriber. So click the little subscribe icon down there and click the little bell so you receive notifications about when we're doing a live stream. Uh, keep an eye on the community page on YouTube. I put a few things there as well. As always, of course, consider becoming a patron or consider becoming a member of the YouTube channel. That helps me uh, fund this uh, so I can keep on going with shows all through the year. And this today's show is one of uh, a lot I have planned for this year that are acknowledging the 80th anniversary of things that were happening in 1942. So I'm going to try and do more of that this year. So um, we are talking about the expansion of the Japanese uh, empire in early 1942. If you join me for Pearl Harbor week in December, that, of course, December 6th and 7th, depending on where you were on the international date line, was when Japan began its conquest and Pearl Harbor, of course, into the into the USA. But of course, there was all the things happening in, towards Singapore and what have you. But today we are talking about New Guinea, which if you have been following World War II TV for a while, we've tackled New Guinea a few times now because um, it was an important part of the Pacific campaign. So today's guest, this is his third um, appearance on World War II TV, and it won't be his last. Philip Bradley is a pretty renowned Australian historian and author, and he wrote a book called Hell's Battlefield that covers what we are talking about today. So without further ado, I introduce Phil. So uh, good evening from where you are, Phil. How are you today? Yeah, good. Good. Thanks, Paul. Good. So, you know, we, we when we talk about the expansion of the Japanese empire, as we've talked about on World War II TV before, it seems that we do tend to look at this from a national lens. So the, the US think about how their country was being impacted by the Japanese expansion. The British, we think about our aspect. The Dutch think about their part. And of course, Australia, their part as well. But essentially, the Japanese weren't separating the campaigns by nation. They were seeing it as one big expansive operation. So it, it, obviously, it's important to you that the world understands just what was happening in early 42 um, and, and New Guinea particularly. And I guess it must be pleasing for you that people like me are a pom, a pom living in France is starting to acknowledge um, some of these Australian campaigns. Yeah, well, well this one particularly is, is a real critical campaign for what happened in the entire South Pacific because this um, the taking of Rabaul, the Japanese um, taking of Rabaul is that and would be, become their main base in the South Pacific area uh, for the uh, war into New Guinea but also into the Solomon Islands. So uh, when we put up a map later, we'll, sh we'll show that exactly what that is. And, and if they had succeeded in that operation to push their perimeter out as it was going to be down to the Solomon Islands and then as, even as far as Samoa and New Caledonia, um, Australia would be totally cut off from the US and that would have made it a lot easier for the Japanese to continue the war in the South Pacific. Yeah, it's it's that early part of the critical part when the Jap Japanese are just starting to control. And it's all, as we know, the Pacific, it's supply lines, it's logistics, it's it's air bases yep. and, and particularly sea bases. So as usual, Phil has come prepared with a, a PowerPoint presentation. I'm going to hand over most of the presentation to him because I I don't know as much about it as he obviously does. Um, but I want to remind people this this is um, the book we're talking about. So Hell's Battlefield, the Australians in New Guinea and World War II has a section on what we're talking about today. But basically, I'm going to hand over to Phil to take us through this. And folks, if you have questions, you know the score. The reason we do these shows live is so you can interact with myself and our guests and ask questions. Sometimes we get the get to the questions immediately when they come up. Sometimes we save them to the end. Sometimes I, you know, I, I do two or three at the same time. I may not get to every question, but we will see what we can do. But please feel free. I always enjoy reading your comments, as do other people. So over to you, Phil, to, to take us through this event. Okay, Paul. So, if we look at the first um, the first slide, uh, we can see uh, Australia there, uh, the big continent to the left, and then um, you can actually see they are the supply lines from the US. So, the US supply lines from uh, west coast of US through Hawaii, and then down through the islands, uh, past New Caledonia to Brisbane and Sydney, and also. Um, down to um, New, New Zealand. So it was important that those supply lines be kept open 
And um, if you look at where those supply lines run, and Rabal is just further north of that, which we'll see on the next map. Okay, so Rabal is um, just, if you can point it out to them, uh, Paul, it's just in the center of the of the slide. Yeah, there. The, the, I, just the way the, I, the, the, the StreamYard now works, I can't have a mouse anymore. I can't point at anything. Okay, so cool. I have to just describe okay, it. So, yeah. Okay, so, so Rabal is uh, just uh, two thirds of the way up the map and one third of the way in from the left hand side there. Um, you'll see at the top of New Britain. And um, Controlling that, that, that's a massive, it's, a, it's an incredible seaport, uh, a, a sea base, and it had, it had two main airstrips also constructed with room for more. So it was a really critical point as a, as a supply centre for the uh, further invasion of New Guinea and down through the Solomon Islands, which you'll see <coughs> with those arrows, and they were the Japanese uh, movements uh, down into the Solomon Islands to Guadalcanal and also down towards... Um, uh, towards New Guinea. So Rabaul was a real real pivotal uh, point for the Japanese and they put massive resources into taking it um, and the Australians uh, put uh, much less resource into defending it. And, and there's an aerial view of, of Rabaul um, and you can see there the harbour um, in the middle there. Um, is a, is a, it's a beautiful harbour. It's, it's a massive harbour. It's a deep harbour. Um, you can also see uh, a number of volcanoes, active volcanoes, which are in the area, um, which um, create that sort of landform. And then down at the bottom, you can see another bay uh, where you can also bring in supplies. But it's, a, it's an easily defendable harbour, a perfect, a perfect base, as I said, with airfields as well, perfectly positioned between the Japanese bases up at Truk and, Palau, and the one they'd have at Palau, and then down towards, um, as I say, from there, they can prosecute the war down into uh, New Guinea and the Solomon Islands. And just a kind of a basic question before you get into the, the more detailed presentation. You know, I'm, as you will, everyone knows, I'm a D-Day guy, I'm a Normandy guy, and we talk a lot about the planning for the Allied invasion of France, and, and the Japanese had planned this. What kind of intelligence do they have about these myriad of islands and inlets and channels? Because, you know, the, uh, we, the distance of their expansion is just absolutely massive and it encompasses all sorts of terrain and islands and size islands. So how do they build up in that kind of 41, 42 period a picture of exactly what it is they're going to be doing? Is it aerial reconnaissance? Is it local information they've had for, for decades or a bit of everything? Yeah, they certainly, um, they build up a really good... Um, picture of, uh, of these strategic places before the war. So they knew exactly uh, what was at Rabaul and um, where the airfields were. Uh, and I'll, as we, when we come to the invasion maps, you'll see on them how accurate they were. So the Japanese knew exactly uh, which places they wanted to take and uh, also such things as, um, you know, the, the depths of the harbour, the, um, how to get move their ships around uh, some of these island areas, um, which, which have coral reefs and such. Um, and there's, there's even an occasion, um, there's, a, there's a coral reef, you, you've heard of the Great Barrier Reef off Australia, mm. and one of the islands there, um, sometime, whether it was prior to the war, uh, the Japanese blew a, we believe it was a Japanese blew a, blew a gap in the in the reef so you could get into the island as a as a base and they were doing things like this all around the south pacific even before the war so um yeah the japanese were very well prepared and obviously they had very good aerial reconnaissance at this stage as well because they had uh, air superiority in these areas yeah yeah are we moving on yeah there's a and there's a, obviously a modern photo yeah, that's a modern photo taken from what, what was called at that time Frisbee Ridge, which is a ridge behind uh, Rabaul. It's actually where the Australians had uh, their anti-aircraft guns installed um, while they were there. And you can see they're looking out over the harbour. There's only about half a dozen ships in the harbour there. But you can see what a beautiful uh, harbour it is and uh, how well protected it is. Um, and um, you could put a lot of ships in there, as the Japanese uh, certainly did. Super. So now we'll get on. We'll get on a little bit to the defence. Uh, what setups were set up for the defence of um, of Rabaul? So um, Rabaul was first. Uh, the first time they sent forces, the Australians sent a force there, was in uh, March and April of 1941. So we're talking, um, you know, six uh, eight months out from the start of the war. But there was obviously starting to realise, hey, we're going to we could well be at war in this area, and we need to defend these. Uh, this base particularly because it's a, it's an important base. 
Um, so they sent up a, um, a battalion, uh, the second, 22nd Battalion, which was one of the 8th, 8th Division battalions, which uh, most uh, two brigades of the 8th Division went to Singapore and Malaya and fought there, and one was split into three battalions, and one of the battalions went to Rabaul. The other ones went to other small islands um, uh, in the area, uh, further, further around at Timor and, uh, and such. But certainly at Rabaul, they only had, they had one battalion. It was called Lark Force. It came under the command of uh, uh, Colonel Scanlon, who was a, um, a World War I battalion commander and uh, they'd shown a lot of um, a lot of drive at that time but um, so they put him in charge of this this operation and the battalion came under the command of uh, Colonel um, Carr but but uh, Colonel Scanlon was in command now apart from the um, the battalion of troops he also had uh, two of the uh, two of these six inch guns in place and these were in place right at the entrance to the harbor a place called Prade Point. So these were the main defences of Rabaul. Basically, any ships coming into that harbour could be hit by these uh, these two guns. They're actually in place, one on top of the other one, which would actually come to cause a problem. But um, they, they were the main defence of Rabaul. There was also, um, it wasn't until, um, they also had two three-inch uh, anti-aircraft guns. These were quite, um, quite old anti-aircraft guns, and they were put up on Frisbee Ridge, but they were, um, they would prove quite... Um, and, and these, these, these troops are there, Phil. Um, you know, yeah. the, 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 the invasion hasn't started yet, but as we all know, war That's is correct. looming. It's kind of a matter of when rather than if it's going to happen. Yeah. But th if and when these areas get attacked, would the defenders be expecting to actually prevent that attack coming in, successfully defend, or is it about buying time for a bigger force to come to a part of essentially the Singapore plan, which is kind of to allow the Royal Navy and everybody else to come down from elsewhere in the world, or are they actually trying <coughs> to hold it and defend it on their own? <clears throat> they didn't have the force to defend it. Um, the, the, they also had aircraft. They had um, <clears throat> not till December 41, not till the war started, did they send aircraft up there, but they had 10 Wirraway fighters. Wirraway fighter, is basically a, a Harvard uh, trainer, um, and there's a picture of one there. So these were the type of aircraft they had up there. And they had 10 of those. <clears throat> they had uh, four Hudson bombers, um, which were a, a more important twin-engine bomber, which were a more important plane mainly because they could do recon out from, yeah. the, out from the base and see if the Japanese force was coming. <clears throat> but, but back to your question... Um, and there was another book written about Rabaul, uh, quite an extensive book, and they call that book Hostages to Fortune. And basically um, the government, Australian government, um, put these guys in there as hostages to fortune. There was no way they were going to hold a major Japanese attack, and it was basically a, um, uh, you know, just a, just an action to show, hey, we, we're going to defend our area. But, but these poor guys uh, were... Uh, they really had no chance, and we'll we'll get into that as we as we go into the into the story. It's a it's a vast area to try to defend, and really you need to project force from Rabaul with a, a modern air force and a modern. They had no naval ships, for example. Uh, they just didn't have the force, and even the guns they had, six inch guns. I mean, uh, Japanese cruisers uh, were were mounting you know ten inch guns or whatever, and they could outrange them and blast them and. and and also they had obviously a, a carrier force. <clears throat> so there was always going to be an overwhelming... Uh, the Japanese wanted Rabaul, they were going to take it, but the Australians, I guess, didn't want to just say, well, just walk in, we're not going to defend it. Yeah, can't just hand it over, so you make a, you make a token effort, which is which is kind of the, the, the experience for a lot of the early part of the war when you think of the BEF in France. It's not necessarily trying to stop it, it's making, an, making a show. Uh, but anyway, we'll, we'll move on. So... Um, um, I'll keep on moving. Yeah, the well, yeah. Well, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about the air, the air phase because that started first. So, <clears throat> the first air raids on 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 Rabaul took place on the fourth of January, nineteen forty two. So, you think about that. That's less than a month after the start of the war in the Pacific. The Japanese were were, were bombing, and this was a, 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 a bombers came over. Uh, Eighteen bombers uh, bombed the main, uh, main airfield uh, called Lacunai Airfield, which is in the sort of sort of centre of the town. Airfield, and um, they um, the anti-aircraft guns couldn't even reach them. Uh, they were too high altitude for the aircraft gun, anti-aircraft guns. So basically, they they were able to um, to fire un, un, uh, uncontested. 
And by the time the Wirraways got up there, they were gone. Um, then two days later um, and, the third, and, and the day after that, they then bombed the second airfield, which was the main airfield, which was Huna Canal, which was further inland, and that was where the Australian air, aircraft were based. So it was bombed on 6th of January. Then more, more raids came uh, a week later. So now we're leading up to less than a week before the attack. Uh, they're increasing the raids. And then the biggest raid came on the 20th of January. And this was carried out by the uh, mob, uh, mobile carrier fleet. These are basically the carrier fleet uh, that had been to Pearl Harbour. Yeah. So you basically had four carriers and 109 uh, naval aircraft uh, attacking Rabaul. Um, so against that, the Australians put up their forces uh, and uh, of eight were aways that went up. Three were shot down and three were damaged. Uh, one of the guys who was watching from the ground just said it was like hawks being attacked by, uh, like hawks attacking sparrows. And that's yeah. pretty much um, uh, what happened. Uh, so then uh, the commander of the Australian, the uh, RAAF contingent there, a um, uh, guy called uh, LaRue, uh, John LaRue, he said, uh, he said to the Australian uh, command, he said, look, the best thing we can do is pack up in, the, in one of the Hudsons, get all our men out of here, uh, pack the Hudsons up and get out of here. And he was told, no, you will stay there with, I think they had two Wirraways left and send them up in the next attack. So his reply to that um, was a reply which came from the old Roman gladiator uh, salute, which is uh, morituri vos salutimus, which means we are we who are about to die salute you. Wow. <laughs> that was quite a famous message. Uh, so I think he got his message across. But um, uh, obviously the air... So this is one of the aircraft, actually, one of the Wirraways, which is in Rabaul today. Uh, and it was shot down during the raid, um, so it's still there. It's the remains of one of the ones that was uh, engaged in that action. Yeah. <clears throat> so now we're looking at Rabaul. Um, we can see um, it's hard for me to see that, but uh, the Parade Point is out is is that furthest to the right, just where the it's like the entrance to Blanche Bay, which is the main right, harbour, yeah. and that's where the two uh, the two guns were positioned. Um, now, the bombing raid actually um, uh, would hit that hit one of those guns, and it would fall down onto the one below it. So that put those two six-inch guns out of out of uh, action. And as soon as that happened, the commander uh, in Rabaul said, "Well, there's no point in trying to defend uh, Rabaul because we there's no point in defending the guns." So he pulled all his forces back, and you can see there where the forces were positioned further to the south. Um, there's a he had four, four companies, so there's one company uh, just halfway up, A company, and yep. some NGVR, which is New Guinea Volunteer Rifles. Then he had another company over further over on the right-hand side there and, another, and then a couple further back, and that was his main defence against the Japanese invasion. Now, the Japanese invasion force, which was uh, sent to um, invade Rabaul, was called the South Seas Force. And this was made up of an infantry regiment, the 144th Infantry Regiment, plus artillery and engineers, <coughs> about 5,000 men. And they had left Guam a week earlier on the 14th of January, that invasion force. So they reached, um, they reached Rabaul on the night of 22nd of January. So we're talking 80 years ago now, Today, basically. Yep. yep, yep. So in my time, there, it's uh, 22... At 22, uh, uh, 20 when they anchored, so that's 10, uh, 20 past 10 at night. Um, so uh, that's exactly what time uh, it's about an hour from now. Mm. Um, and then one hour later, they started landing, um, and the, and they started unloading, and they landed at dawn on the on the twenty third of January. So that they were coming in during the night. Um, so as I said before, the um, the uh, on the when the um, guns had been damaged, uh, Colonel Scanlon ordered the HQ and everyone else to move further over, as I said, to uh, south of Rabaul and be, be ready to uh, evacuate Rabaul. Um, there's a fellow, uh, there's an ambulance section uh, that was attached to the uh, defenders called the 2nd 10th Field Ambulance. And one of their members was a guy called uh, Private Billy Cook. And Billy Cook later wrote in his, um, wrote about it and he said, uh, you don't try to stop an avalanche. And that was the general opinion at the time. They would maybe put up a token resistance, but they had to try and get out of there. 
um, and uh, evacuate Rabaul, or they're all going to be captured. So the main defence um, basically covered this exit point um, that you can see there, back towards uh, Vuna Canal Airfield, which is at the bottom of the, um, the bottom of the photo. Um, but we had Major Owen um, had his company near Vulcan, um, which is in the centre there, A Company. And, and they would be right in the way of a Japanese attack. So if we go to the next slide, um, you can see that a bit better. So this is the Japanese um, uh, attack diagram. And you can see there the points that we're going to land. So we're going to land at Kokopo, which is uh, number one, just at the yep. bottom there. Then they we're going to land at Vulcan, which is exactly where Owen's company was uh, positioned. And then they're also going to land directly in the town. And they're also going to land on the other side of the... Um, peninsula as well and at the top and and those three landings would be uncontested and so would ultimately the one in the center but the other ones would be contested uh, go to the next slide and this is the landing at uh at vulcan uh which is in the center there um right in the center is where the japanese uh, landed and they landed right on top of uh, right on top of the australians um at that point so the Owens company also had some two pound anti tank guns um, and he um, he he stopped basically stopped the Japanese landing a company of Japanese landing was stopped mainly he had two mortars and two Vickers guns which were very he employed very effectively like in any battle uh, if you've got the heavier weapons the Japanese obviously uh, had landed under some they basically landed without support uh, just infantry company and so they suffered uh, in that early attack but there were other landings and um, the Japanese would, it, they were ashore and that was the main thing. So they could outflank uh, uh, Owen, uh, particularly the landings that took place un unopposed further to the to the north there. So Owen's uh, then pulled his men back at uh, 7.30 in the morning. Um, and at that stage with dawn breaking, they could see there were 30, 30 Japanese vessels anchored in the harbour. So you can imagine how many men and... Uh, equipment was on those and so they had nothing to fight that with they had no air force left the two guns had been destroyed they really had no other weapons they had no for example if they had have had a 25 pounder um battery a couple of batteries of 25 pounders they could have really done some damage to those ships but they they really were poorly um, equipped to do that sort of uh, any any sort of real damage um, I mean, what, so they pulled back Sorry to interrupt you there, Phil, but our mutual yeah, friend Ross Cable is saying there about you know the penny packets of, of Australian troops on on you know around the harbour there, and you know sure. we, we can see this this disconnect now with the benefit of eighty years of this professional Japanese force landing in multiple places from different directions with a sizable force, lots of ships, plenty of air support, and we can see this rather haphazard air defence, not enough guns, not enough troops as being as being not going to be strong enough what was the thinking at the time i mean what you know if you were a company commander or a you know a, a young subaltern in the unit like that what yeah. what would if you what would you be thinking if you're an australian defender there did, did you feel this was hopeless before he had shots or even fired or did they have any kind of confidence that what they would do might work i think i think the guys who were defending thought they could you know they would they would give it a show the infantrymen yeah. in the front line but without, as you know, without artillery support or even some armoured support or something that gives you um, indirect fire, that, you know, even with mortars and, and figures machine guns, they basically stop one of the landings. So I think that the, um, if it came from the, the head guy who was Scanlon, and Scanlon had already pulled his headquarters back to Vuna Canal, which is behind the front line, and is basically saying, well, you know, we're going to, um, you know, we're not going to stay and fight. And um, I think that carried through to the men. Um, there just wasn't a, the desire there. And, and Ross made a good point with his point about penny packeting um, the units. So these three battalions from that brigade, which came out of Malaya, uh, one went to Rabaul, one went to Ambon, which is a small island um, in, in, now in Indonesia, and one went to Timor. And, 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 and in those three cases, they were, were never enough to hold any invasion. So it's, they were just basically a token force. Yeah. And um, and all were lost, uh, and many of those men never uh, never came home because they died in prison camps or on their way to prison camps. So, 
yeah, it was pretty uh, a pretty depressing um, situation. And uh, Ross makes a good point. Do, do we forget this uh, in our history that um, you just can't defend places with penny packets? Yeah. Yeah. No, definitely. So we go to the next um, slide. Um, this is a good. This is a painting of uh, the defence of uh, that beach at Vulcan by Owen's men, and um, you can see the mortar there on the right, and the Japanese attacking in the night, um, the early morning landing, and just um, the effect of even just a couple of mortars and a couple of uh, Vickers guns was 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 incredible. And but that's all they had, you know, they had they had no higher weaponry, so. They basically given up from the start, uh, particularly with the, the lack of air power. Now that air power problem, and, and not so much um, quantity, but also quality of aircraft, uh, that played out. That played out in Malaya big time, and it played out throughout the South Pacific at that time. Um, that they just didn't have the quality of aircraft uh, to defend um, to defend these places. And without air power, uh, you're always going to struggle to. to when to you've got less less a, a, a less um, suitable equipment and a plan yeah. that is not quite as good, and you're outnumbered, it's all kind of a recipe for disasters. I mean, Ross Cable is going to come and do totally. some stuff about Singapore and Malaya later on in the year. Yeah, totally. And, you know, totally. It's, when all of these things are stacked up against you, you can be the bravest soldier in the world. You, you, you're, not going to, you're not going to come out of this any other way. It, you know, you're, it's outgunned, outnumbered, outfought. It's, uh, it's classic. But this era of the war, this, this 42 era is the classic... Japanese have the advantage. Uh, we're not talking about the 44, 45 year when you were on talking no, about the, the invasion back into New Guinea. The Allies have yeah. the superiority, but not not now. Certainly not now. Certainly not now. And, yeah. and and that's a and that's a real fault because if you consider that um they they knew this was coming, uh, but they just didn't have they just weren't preparing for it. Uh Australia, mostly Australian, certainly Australian regular army. They had sent three divisions to uh, the Middle East. They'd only sent one to the South Pacific, uh, you know, that when that went to Malaya. Most of the RAAF, <coughs> the best pilots, navigators and such, were serving with Bomber Command and uh, Fighter Command in uh, Europe. Um, the Navy was also mainly serving in... Uh, uh, most of the capital ships were in the Mediterranean. And what ones they had, they would soon lose in the South. In the Pacific, of course, we had <coughs> the promise of the... Uh, the British fleet, um, and they had um, been sunk. The two, the two capital ships that were sent um, were sent to yeah. the uh, Singapore, and then also, of course, what happened to the US fleet at that stage? They were struggling as well. Um, anyway, this is a picture of uh, the memorial that was put up at this at Vulcan near Vulcan, where, where the defence took place and the landing took place that morning. So that was taken um, after the war uh, when they put that memorial up. Um, but that was a point where the Japanese, they showed they could stop the Japanese landing. Um, that was basically a company of men taking on a battalion and stopping them um, until they got around the flanks, of course, because they just didn't have a, a full line there. Yeah. Yeah. And that's the heaviest weaponry they had in the battalion, which is basically a two-pounder anti-tank gun. This is interesting. I was in, first went to Rabaul back in the 90s, and this gun was still not far from um, where it had been um, abandoned during the war. Uh, it's still in Rabaul. It's a two-pounder Australian anti-tank gun made in Australia and uh, sent to Rabaul. Um, basically, they, they weren't, Japanese didn't land tanks. They didn't need to use it, but could be used in an anti-landing uh, craft role or something like that. But um, this was abandoned at this time. Yeah, there's still lots of memories of war still uh, around Rabaul. So now we can look at what happened um, as, as the um, Australians uh, pulled back. So you can see there um, in the centre, uh, Vuna Canal. So that's the main airstrip, which they decided um, they couldn't even defend that. So they pulled back to Toma and then to Malaguna. Basically, they're, they're looking to, to retreat across the mountains and um, try to get out of, um, try to get the men out of, uh, out of the area. Um, but the pre-planning was terrible. Scanlon had, had not allowed like food caches to be left on the trail that would lead them across the ranges, the Baining Ranges, uh, things like this. So they were basically um, they were scrambling to get out of there as quick as they could. Um, but they, as I say, they um, they didn't want to surrender, but they also didn't want to. Uh, they didn't have the ability then to stay and fight. There were just too many Japanese at that stage that landed. Um, now, Scanlon um, ordered Carr um, to pull his battalion. Uh, all the way back to the Caravat River. And you can see the Caravat River there on the left. 
just to the left of Malabunga. Um, and that's where they were ordered to pull all the way back to. Um, and then uh, there's a guy up on the, um, the, the anti-aircraft officer, actually, a guy called David Selby, who later wrote a really good book about it. And he said um, that Scanlon was now um, basically panicking. And he just said uh, that the colonel's orders are that each man is to fend for himself. So that's what, so basically it became a shambles because <clears throat> there was no orderly um, retreat. There was no, um, it, the, the, basically the Lark Force ceased to function, the battalion ceased to function. Some men held together with their companies, but basically it was every man for himself. Grab what you could and get out of there. And, of course, there was no road beyond the river, so they could take vehicles back to the river and then they just had to fend for themselves, grab what supplies they could, um, and as I say, they hadn't stored supplies further back for this eventuality, which they should have seen coming. And that, um, that's, you know, I'm going to re reiterate what you said there. It's not like yeah. these defenders had arrived a week before the invasion. They've been there for months and, and they kind no, of was, know was... the size of force coming towards them. So not having set up some kind of fallback plan yeah. where you say you've got provisions of ammunition and water yeah. and food and stuff, and at least plan your routes back, plan your evacuation routes, plan your stand, you know, last stand positions. To not have had that in place seems seems a bit of an oversight. It's a bit like um, if you look at um, some of the actions in Europe where um, the, the high command of the German army, for instance, is saying, well, we're not going to make defence lines, you know, further back on the Russian front because everyone will pull back to them, you know, and, and things like that. So basically here they're saying we're not going to we're not going to make it easier to get out and, and survive because then all, that's all people want to do. Well, that's all they could do. So it was pretty, um, pretty. Uh, short-sighted thinking yeah, for definitely. sure we'll go to the next picture that's selby there the guy i was telling you about david selby who was in command of the um anti-aircraft unit so he he blew his guns up and then as i say pulled his men out and um he was a guy who in his book wrote about scanlon's order basically saying it's every man for himself and wow. uh that to me is a really da the damning um thing that came out of this whole um shamozzle yeah. Next picture. Now, this was taken on Caviang and on the same morning. And now, Caviang is uh, a bit further um, further up from Rabaul, another island, um, uh, and uh, further around on New Island. It was also a, it was a much smaller base, but it was just defended by a company of Australian um, commandos, or basically a platoon of commandos, and they were uh, most of them were captured during the um, during the operation. Um, and they're Japanese. Uh, they're actually Japanese uh, Marines uh, who'd landed there and have taken one of the Australians captured. Yeah, they tied behind their backs. They'd have a pole behind their backs so they'd keep straight and keep their hands behind their backs. And uh, so that was captured in the same day. You basically had 3,000 Japanese troops landed up against 150 men. So, again, it's another example of what we're talking about with the, um, the, the hopelessness of this, uh, mm. of this situation. So if we look at Rabaul now, the um, area south of Rabaul, you can see Rabaul at the top. You can see the Karabat River, which they pulled back to. But then they had to cross the Gazelle Peninsula, and it's, it's called the Baining Ranges. So there's a range, uh, uh, a mountain range in between. And try to get to the south coast around Wide Bay or Open Bay, where perhaps they could get a, um, a flying boat in or, or a boat in or something like that to uh, rescue some of these men and, and get them back to New Guinea and Australia. Uh, so that was um, that was the aim at this stage. And they did, certainly the RAAF were pretty well organised in terms of getting their own men out. So um, they flew into um, Sum Sum, which you'll see on the right there, just um, up from Wide Bay, uh, about halfway up the map, a place called Sum Sum. Yep. Um, so... The RWF Sunderland flying boats flew into Sum Sum and also down at um, at Toll, uh, which is down at Wide Bay, and managed to get um, a lot of the RWF personnel off. But <clears throat> there were too many Army personnel to um, evacuate. And the RWF guys had got off, uh, uh, had, had got around south before the Army, 
Um, they'd, they'd evacuated a bit earlier than a couple of days earlier, and they were able to get around the coast in, in small boats, so they didn't have to cross the ranges, which faced most of, most of the army faced crossing those ranges. Oh. Let's see in the next slide. Uh, so a friend of mine has done this trek from Rabaul through the toll, and there's some of the photos he took. So you can see the sort of um, country you're travelling through, jungle, um, across uh, across quite uh, fast flowing uh, rivers. Um, so quite a um, you know quite quite a uh, not dangerous trek, but uh, quite an arduous trek. But but the men um, the men were able to do it. Yeah, most of them got across. You can see there the thickness of the of the jungle and um, follow, trying to follow the track and uh, but they. Um, they were, you know, they, they they managed to get across, most of them. Yeah, it's uh, we we don't need to. We've talked about it before, but the 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 jungle in New Guinea is is, is something yeah, else, isn't it? And you know, just the so, dealing with the climate and everything else is a, is an ordeal in its own its own right. Own right. So so part of it also is that the Japanese didn't follow them. Um, the Japanese let them. Let, they knew obviously they'd gone and they'd have to trek across. So what the Japanese did is they waited about a week and then they sent uh, five landing craft around to Wide Bay um, with troops on them, and that took place on the 3rd of February. Um, the next slide should give you an idea of that. Okay, so the Japanese arrived. Uh, so this is, um, this is the next phase of, of basically uh, a tragedy heaped on a disaster. So the tragedy of this was took place at this plantation called Toll, uh, which we saw on the map, which was in Wide Bay, south where well, they'd gone across. So the men had gone across and they were gathering, trying to work out whether they could get a boat back to New Guinea or whether they had to trek further down, down New Britain or, or what to do. Um, and the Japanese landed uh, in five landing craft on the 3rd of February. So that's about uh, a week after the, um, a bit over a week after the uh, invasion. Uh, and they captured 123 men, uh, and they put them under guard at, at Toll, uh, the Toll Plantation. Um, now, 22 of those men had uh, met the landing craft and actually surrendered. Um, so they were um, they were allowed to they were put aside, but the other 101 men they had their hands tied behind them with fishing line. Uh, and they were marched away in, in small groups into this plantation. Um, then each man was taken individually and bayoneted to death by the Japanese. Um, so it was something like 101, 101 men. Um, and this is the remains that were found when the Australians went back in 1945. They were still lying in the plantation. Um, it's a pretty sad story. Uh, but there's other sides to it as well. If you go to the next slide, I'll tell us tell a bit of a story about it. This is a um, a commemoration uh, uh, can that was set up by this group. It's a friend of mine who's in the army went across um, some years ago, and they put this plaque on the on a um, commemorating these men who were killed at Toll. Um, so that's uh, that's there today to remember these men. Yeah. Wow. Okay, so this is one of the men who were um, who were captured. It's a guy. His name is Billy Cook, uh, and he's he's really one of my heroes from the war. And I think this guy, in many ways, did as much as anyone to to help win this uh, Second World War for Australia in the in the Pacific. Um, and I'll tell you why. He was in the he was an ambulance man, so he's in the second tenth field ambulance. And when these men were captured, they showed their um, Red Cross Brassage, you know, they said, look, we're, we're uh, medical people, you know, you can't kill us. And, and Japanese had no, had no, uh, uh, didn't worry them. So he was one of the ones who was, um, who was taken away to be, uh, to be bayoneted. In fact, he'd, he'd actually escaped um, earlier on, but he saw everyone else captured and he just thought, well, oh, I may as well give up. You know, he just lost his, lost the heart to, to, right. to stay away. Um, so he was bound to two other men and they were taken forward um, and they were bayoneted in the back. Um, Billy Cook was bayoneted five times in the back and he just went face down in the dirt. And then as he lay in the dirt, he was bayoneted six more times. 
So 11, 11 bayonet wounds to the back. Um, he was still alive. He talked about it. Uh, he said, all the pain there has ever been in the world hit me. Um, you can just imagine the um, what was going on. Um, and then he um, he actually he actually survived. He he was he realised he was still alive, and he was able to get um, he was able to wait till the Japanese left, and he somehow un, you know got the fishing line off with an old tin can he found or something, and then he went down to the shoreline which was close by to bathe his wounds. And you can imagine how that felt, but he um, he was still alive. Um, so then with three others, he, he got together with, he headed down the coast, um, somehow made his way down the coast a little bit, and he ran into the regimental medical officer, uh, Major Ted Palmer, and he took him under his wing and he, um, he, he managed to keep him alive. And then um, he was... Uh, he was taken out on a boat on the 9th of April to, um, to Port Moresby. Um, and he, um, he then went on a boat to Cairns back in Australia, a hospital ship. So as he's in this hospital ship heading back, all the officers, the Australian officers are coming in. They want to see his wounds. And every one of them, you can guarantee that what happened to Billy Cook went right through the Australian Army within weeks. Everyone mm. knew what had happened to Billy Cook. Everyone knew what the Japanese had done and everyone knew what they were going to do to the Japanese when they got into battle with them. And I think that's why I say that this guy had such a, an effect on the war because he hardened. It, it, the, the Japanese had shown their hand and um, you don't get two chances. And uh, so that's how the war was fought. It was a brutal war in the Pacific from then on. You can guarantee it. Not only the Australians knew about what happened at Toll because the guys had come back, Billy Cook had come back, but also the Americans would have known the British would have known, everyone would have known in very short time uh, what happened to Billy Cook. So the next slide, um, just go to that. So now we're going forward to, um, I think it's 19, 1955 um, or 1957. Billy Cook, after the war, he was still badly incapacitated, obviously, with his wounds. But he got a job with the railways um, in Sydney, uh, Central Railway Station. And as you can see from the headline in 1955, he'd had an accident on the railways. He actually fell over on the track and had both his legs cut off by a train. Here's a guy who'd survived the war and this happened to him. And he survived this. He survived this and went on to live into his 70s, into the 70s. Wow. So it's a, uh, it's a hell of a story. And I just uh, I guess not many people have heard of Billy Cook, but perhaps tonight... Uh, some people will take the hat off to Billy Cook and what uh, what he went through, and yeah. uh, just the staunchness of this guy, incredible. And, and you made the very good point. It's an it's a fantastic story of an individual, but it also sets the stall out for how the Pacific campaign is going to be. You know, when we we totally. talk about the ETO and the Eastern Front of the Pacific, you know that there's a there's a different way, a set of rules that everybody begins to adopt because of the nature of the fighting. And, you know, you've only got to look at the difference between HBO's Band of Brothers and the Pacific for the whole, the mood is different. The the sense is different. And, and, and these incidents that happened in 41, 42, and, you know, we're going to be talking about the murders at the Alexandra Hospital in a, in a few weeks yeah. on, on World War II TV and these other instances. It, it's, it's those that set out the rest of the war and why this sort of mist of brutality comes on both sides. And, and it's important to understand where these things start because they have a, the Billy Cook story is a starting to, point, isn't it? It's where these things yeah, begin. You have to understand this. You have to understand it. It's a big part of the war. You can talk about the battles and everything. Talk about this guy's battles. What, what was going on in his mind when he lived and then when he uh, survived and then survived uh, uh, getting his legs chopped off as well. Unbelievable. I tried to contact his family, but um, they're not um, they're not that conducive to talking. But that's, wow. I can understand that as well. So that's fine. So what a story! Yeah. But we'll keep on moving. So yeah. So at the end of the war, uh, they actually recovered 158 bodies from Toll. So there were some others killed after the first lot. But um, that's the stain on the on the Japanese. Um, mm. You talk about Japanese military, and and a lot of people take the hat off to them, and sure they they could be good fighters and that as well. But this side of it, 
cannot be forgotten. Absolutely. Okay, so we'll go forward now um, to another tragedy, an even bigger tragedy. And this is um, this ship is the Montevideo Maru. And um, the Montevideo Maru uh, was used to transport uh, those who were captured in, um, in Rabaul, because there were civilians in Rabaul as well, remember? There were nurses yeah. in Rabaul. There were uh, obviously all the troops that were captured. There were some uh, other troops captured in outlying areas that were brought to Rabaul. There were some airmen captured. Anyway, so they decided they'd send they'd send a, a whole bunch of them. Uh, so the 845 soldiers and 208 civilians, that's a 1,053 people, um, were sent uh, from Rabaul. They were sent off to Hainan Island, which is off China. Um, so it's quite a long trip north. Um, so they'd be sent to Hainan Island, where they would be put to work probably in coal mines or mining areas or such, uh, which is what... Uh, tended to happen to the to the prisoners. So the the ship left Rabaul on the twenty second the twenty second of June, nineteen forty two. So basically five months after the invasion, they were sending these these all these men off. So all these men were the men captured in um, in Rabaul. Um, yeah. The officers actually most uh, one of the officers survived because they went to a different a different route. Um, so nine days later, so on the um, on the 1st of July, uh, 1942, uh, off the coast of the Philippines, um, an American submarine, the USS Sturgeon, uh, spotted this, this vessel moving up the coast and a uh, great target. Um, there was no indication that it had prisoners on it, obviously. And um, the, the, the vessel was torpedoed. And, all, of course, all the prisoners are, are trapped down in the holes and, and they, all, they were all drowned. Um, so there's an even bigger tragedy from Rabaul. So 1,053 people lost their lives. So it's the worst, um, the worst uh, maritime disaster, certainly in Australia's history, um, wow. and one of the worst incidents of the war, I'm sure. So, yeah. so now we'll just move on a bit to what happened to Rabaul um, after after it was taken. So the Japanese set up quite a strong air and naval base. So here you can see uh, Japanese aircraft uh, on uh, Lacunae uh, airfield, which is the airfield closest to the centre. Um, and from this airfield, they could um, head down to uh, Guadalcanal or head over to New Guinea or wherever it was required to, um, to, um, to push air power. Yeah. The next slide, I think, is taken at the same spot. <laughs> and you can see there, this is the... Uh, the uh, volcano going off, I think in the mid-90s, about 1995, the volcano went off and uh, Rabaul actually was covered in ash and had to be evacuated. And now the Rabaul, the capital um, of that area, has been moved further along the coast to a place called Kokopo, further around the bay. So the main centre of Rabaul is now just uh, uh, basically covered in ash and uh, wow. as a result of these volcanoes, yeah. Um, so obviously the fact that um, Rabaul was um, this main Japanese base, it was certainly a, um, a key target in the Allied planning in how to how they would take um, New Guinea and move forward uh, in the war up to the Philippines, as MacArthur wanted to do. So this is an aerial shot taken of, um, of Rabaul, and you can see how many uh, vessels are in the harbour. Um, so this was taken... Um, taken in, in around 1943 sometime when there was still a lot of activity, particularly around Bougainville, where the Japanese were responding to the Amer American landings on Bougainville. Um, and you can see there the, 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 side, the side, num number of targets. So that, that was a key key area to attack. Um, at, it, the, Amer the, the Allied planning at the time in 1943, we talked a little bit about this when I talked about D-Day New Guinea. Yeah. Uh, it was called a cartwheel plan. And cartwheel plan... Actually, when it came out in March 1943, the idea was that Rabaul would be a target um, and be attacked. So there would be a landing at Rabaul and they wanted to capture it. This soon changed because of the strength of the Japanese there and, and the resources that would be needed to mount that attack, that they would actually, um, instead of attack it, instead of uh, directly attack it, they would just isolate it. And that yeah. became the policy. And that isolation would take place through air offensives. 
And if we look at the next... Uh, and just, well, we've got a couple of questions. So Ian, Ian Carr yeah. asked earlier, Phil, about did yeah. how much expansion to the harbour did the Japanese do or did they not need to? Was it just already had the facilities they needed? Because you said, it, you know, it could, it could accommodate a lot of ships. Did they do any structural work to make more jetties, keys? They, they made some and they brought in a, a crane and such, but but pretty much their main thing was to use the facilities that were there. And most of the facilities, uh, they they would offload onto landing, small landing craft. And, and as you can see, the ships were anchored in the harbour rather than come into the... Um, it had very poor dock facilities. So mo there was just a small dock, but most of the ships were unloaded in the harbour. And so the troops or supplies would come in on small um, landing craft. And it's, it's interesting, even today, there's a, there's a, a landing craft... It, it, were, were hauled up from the bay into tunnels to protect them during air raids and such. Wow. Um, the Japanese were very good at this sort of stuff. And, and, and they, they dug tunnels everywhere throughout Rabaul to store things in. So it was a real, became a real fortress. Okay. And, um, and uh, but so their main thing was to dig tunnels and such to put the supplies in to keep them, um, keep them safe. Okay. And the other question of Maddox Parkey is about, the Australian defenders of you know of eighty years ago this week. How many of the second twenty second got out? Yeah, look, about I think it was around two hundred, um, and they managed to get out on boats uh, to New Guinea um, from New Britain. There could have been a few more. It could have been about two fifty. But as you saw uh, when I put up the Montevideo Maru, there were eight hundred and forty five soldiers on the Montevideo Maru who were captured men. Yeah. So the total force uh, was about. 1100 1200 so if you take that away it's probably about 250 might have got off yeah wow and in yeah, fact my, uh, interesting major owen uh who was in charge of that really staunch defense of the beach with a company at vulcan he got back and he was given command of a battalion at kokoda and he was actually killed at kokoda um so they really these guys who cameron was another one um who came across uh, Captain Cameron, and he later became a battalion commander as well. So you had um, these guys who had experience fighting the Japanese at Rabaul uh, got positions back in Australia as, um, you know, to, to lead men in the, uh, in the jungles in uh, New Guinea. Super stuff. So here you can see, um, uh, t this is taken during a, a US Air Force attack on Rabaul. And you can see just at the, at the bottom in the centre, uh, Japanese uh, twin 127-millimetre anti-aircraft gun. And you can see how uh, this white phosphorus sort of bomb has gone off and just uh, dropping down onto this position. And that's the sort of American air power at work, basically knocking out the defences so they then can attack directly the airfields and the, the shipping in particular. Mm. So just concentrate on that gun, and that's the gun today. It's still there. Uh, it's a twin 127 millimeter um, anti-aircraft gun, uh, and we found that up on that ridge. Um, this is back in the, about 2000. I was I was there with my mate uh, Steve stuff. Saunders in the back. You know. Steve's actually a volcanologist. Works up at the volcano okay. centre there. Uh, so really it's like the, it's like some of the battlefields that when you visit there now. Yeah. You're yeah. seeing various stages of the war. There's 1940 yeah, stuff, absolutely. 42 stuff from Australia, and there's yeah. also the 43, 44 stuff. So you have to totally decipher which yeah. which era you're looking at. Uh, yeah, but this is an interesting one, as I say, because it shows up on that earlier photo. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. it was an interesting one to find. Yeah. Fantastic. And there you can see the sort of low level bombing. They're bombing um, the Japanese air airfields. Um, so there's quite a few aircraft there, uh, different aircraft all lined up and sort of pushed into the plantation. And um, so low level bombing um, really uh, made a mess of uh, the Japanese aircraft and ultimately um, the bombing um, basically wiped out Rabaul as an airbase, and therefore it was it was it wasn't a real threat. So wiping it out as an airbase, and then as you'll see, hitting any um, any warships that came into the harbour as well, they could actually um, just isolate Rabaul and, and make it not um, have mm -hmm. no further part in the war, and basically became one big prison camp for yeah. the rest of the war. And this is one of the Japanese aircraft. Um, at Lacuna air, air, Airfield, this is a Sally, a Sally twin-engine bomber. And you can see there, after the um, volcano's gone off, and the, it's basically half buried under ash. So <laughs> that's a really interesting uh, relic, that one. That's yeah, fantastic. 
this is a famous photo of um, uh, this. These uh, these were taken on 5th of November 1943. So this is just after the um, American landing on Bougainville. So the Japanese had sent a lot of supply ships and warships down to Rabaul to try to fight off that attack. Uh, and these are low-level uh, um, B-25 bombers uh, coming in at low level over Rabaul Harbour and um, take, trying to take out that merchant ship in the middle there. Um, and we talked a little bit about this in D-Day New Guinea and how General Kenny, the American Air Commander, developed these low-level strafing yep. and low-level bombing, skip bombing attacks, which uh, which were really effective against um, against shipping, much more effective than high-level bombing, where you're really trying to hit a, you know, you really had very little chance of hitting the target. Yeah, and we did. We talked about it with Michael Veach in the show about the Battle of the Bismarck Sea. We talked yeah, about sure, the Battle of the Bismarck Sea showed, showed it up perfectly. So yeah, this lots, is lots of development now. there. Yeah, I mean that's the that, that's yeah, the yeah, thing. For sure. We can we can yeah. chart that progression, and we can look back and say, Absolutely. yes, Australian forces in forty two were under under strength, under you know outfought tactically. But within a year, two years, the Allies, Australians, British, Americans, we do we do learn a hell of a lot in that theatre and implement these well, ideas. This is a great so, example. Now, imagine if if they had this this weapon, um, and they couldn't develop this weapon. They had these B-25s available doing this low-level strafing on when the Japanese actually came into attack. Yeah. That's not to say that would have been successful because the Japanese had a lot, a lot of air superiority, a lot of fighters around at that time. But these guys came in fast and low, and they would, as you see, there's a there's a Japanese cruiser in the middle there that they've, um, they're, they're hitting. Um, so it's quite, a, um, uh, it, it's quite an effective means. I talked to one of the – there was an Australian liaison officer who flew with these strafers. And he told me, he said, we're flying in Rabaul. And he said, you could see the the, the Japanese would lower their um, main weaponry, uh, you know, eight-inch guns or whatever they were, and fire to, to hit up water spouts in front of the aircraft to make them hit the water spouts so they would, they would you know, uh, crash. Wow. And um, he, he, could, he, still, he said, I can still remember these orange flashes coming at me uh, from the eight-inch guns trying to hit a B-25. But they weren't trying to hit the aircraft. They were trying to smash it into the water in front of them so the splashes they had to go through the the big splash and that crash so it's wow, quite an amazing story yeah it is definitely yeah. so i got my mate steve saunders he went he took a flight over the same area and and you can see there that's the vulcan in the background the the volcano and um there's still um, ships there today so it's from the same spot yeah brilliant photo and, and i'm talking about brilliant, another brilliant photo yeah that is a brilliant photo. So this guy's just done his bomb run, a um, guy called uh, How, H-O-W-E. Uh, I think his plane's Chucky or something. But he um, he's just done the bomb run uh, across the harbour and he's heading back up up through the uh, – between the um, between the volcano and, and a sort of uh, low-level area trying to get out of there. Yeah. You can see the shark's teeth on the front of his plane. Yeah, brilliant. Really cool, cool photo. And obviously, and that's the same view again. Steve's view, yeah. So it's the same. You see the volcano on the right there, and they've just come across the harbour and heading down the road. <laughs> okay, so basically, um, as I say, Rabaul became basically a Japanese um, prison camp for the rest of the war. And um, the Americans um, had isolated it, and then the Australians took over in that area. They landed some troops south of Rabaul and New Britain around Wide Bay and Toll area, uh, but they didn't advance into Rabaul. They just isolated it until the end of the war. So at the end of the war, um, the Australians had estimated there were 55,000 Japanese in Rabaul. Uh, when they actually went in and counted them in October 1945, there were 97,500, so nearly twice the estimate. That's a lot of men, 97,500 uh, Japanese in Rabaul. Um, half of those are Navy, half of those are Army. Uh, some civilians were there as well, but a lot of people. And so this photo now is taken on 6th of September, 1943, uh, 1945, sorry, when the um, British aircraft carrier HMS Glory was sent to take the surrender of the Japanese. So it was sent into Rabaul Harbour. So here you go. It was an Australian uh, defeat at the start of the war. American air power really hammering it around. And then the British come along at the end of the war and sail their aircraft carrier into the harbour and, <laughs> and take the surrender. 
Yeah. Well, surrender was actually taken by General Sturdy, Vernon Sturdy, who was Australian, who was Australian commander uh, of the um, army in that um, in that area. And so there's two guys there surrendering. Um, the Japanese uh, would never surrender. The army guy, General Imamura, he was from the army, and General um, Kusaka represented the navy. So an army commander could not surrender navy forces or vice versa. So they had to have two guys surrendering. Um, so they surrendered on uh, the 9th of, um, uh, sorry, 6th of September, 1945. Right. I think there's another shot, the next shot. I think yeah, there's another yeah, one. There's a closer, one. closer up yeah. shot uh, of the two Japanese and obviously um, giving up their swords as a, a token to do that. So after that, um, there were prisoners still at, at Rabaul. Um, there were 22 Europeans released. Um, some of those were um, airmen, uh, American airmen and Australian airmen who'd been shot down and captured and uh, hadn't been killed during the war. There were 600 Indians um, set free um, who had been sent to Rabaul to work. And there were another 1,400 um, Asian labourers uh, yeah. released. They were, they were Chinese, Malays or Indonesians uh, all released um, at that time. And um, the Japanese themselves, um, they set them up in, in their own camps and then they were repatriated over time um, back, to, um, back to Japan. And, and uh, were there investigations the the into the war Sorry? crimes? Were there investigations into the war crimes? At oh, absolutely. Time? Yeah, yeah, there were. Uh, of course, a lot of the um, people involved in those crimes um, had been killed. Um, yeah. that, that unit... Um, I think it was the 2nd Battalion of the 144th Regiment, uh, went to um, fought on a Kokoda track where most of the officers were killed. Um, there was one officer, um, his, his name just escapes me at the moment, but he he was actually, um, he actually survived and it was living in Japan post-war and they were looking to um, take him before a court for the toll massacres and... Uh, he ended up going out to uh, Mount Fuji in the winter and just um, basically dying of um, exposure. That was his mm -hmm. way of um, of dealing with it. Yeah, but um, I mean, the general the, there were war trials in Rabaul. A lot of the um, trials that took place regarding other atrocities during the war took place there, and there were there were um, there were hangings of that. But I, I don't have a, a full um, a summation of that. No, but they they certainly were. There were war trials in um, in Rabaul, and and for example, General Adachi, who was the Japanese commander on New Guinea, he ended up being um, being executed in. Um, okay. And one last question for you: It's uh, the Japanese who surrendered. Were they in good condition? These these ninety seven thousand Japanese had they were they were because we know in other areas they'd been cut off. They weren't getting supplies in. Were they, were they fed well? Did they have ammunition? What 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 was their state? Yeah, yeah. Look, they were they were in pretty good condition, and they had lots of ammunition. They had tanks and they had all sorts of stuff. They had plenty of ammunition and and resources to fight. Uh, food wise, they'd actually. It gone into a major um, gardening program, so they had massive gardens all across that area, and so there was yeah they they were they were self sufficient. Uh, it's interesting, um, and I've studied this in other areas of um, of New Guinea where the Japanese were for a long time till the end of the war, being Bougainville and also mm -hmm. up around Itapu Wewak in New Guinea, and basically um, half the more than half the Japanese uh, fighting forces were deployed as farmers to create. Yeah. To grow local, you know, uh, root vegetables, taro, and this sort of thing, to survive because they had to do that to survive. So um, they were in, yeah, they would have been in good condition if the Australians or Americans had had to fight for a bowl. It would have been a hell of a fight, but um, yeah. they chose the smart way and just used it basically as a as a um, prison camp for the rest of the war. But you know, you, you said yourself that they 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 chose the smart way to to bypass it, but. The, the downside of that is that probably as a within our understanding of history, that 43, 44 chapter kind of gets a bit forgotten because we tend to focus on the, the island hopping where they did actually land troops and there were the battles. So maybe the kind of the conclusion to this story has been lost a little bit because of that bypassing pol policy. Is that, is that a fair comment? I think that um, from my study and, and certainly in Hell's Battlefield, uh, what I make a point of and in my studies in America, in particularly in the um, archives over there, is that 
after what happened at Buna and Gona and San Ananda down on the um, the Papuan coast, they were really brutal, brutal battles uh, fought against entrenched Japanese who just didn't surrender. So after that battle, MacArthur's idea was then, okay, we'll basically fight where the Japanese aren't. We'll land where they aren't and we'll fight from there. And if they'd landed at Rabaul, it's a bit like, also, if you go right to the end of the war, after some of these massive battles in places like Okinawa and Iwo Jima, mm. um, Palau, where they and in Philippines, where they had to land and take positions, the Japanese defended them till the death. You know, very few surrendered. So the same thing would have happened at Rabaul if they'd gone in there, and certainly the same thing would have happened on the Japanese mainland. And this yeah. obviously led to the end of the war with the uh, atomic bombs being dropped to to prevent that. I mean. I don't know about you, but I probably wouldn't be here today. My father was in the seventh division, Australian seventh yeah. division. They would have no, been no, no, my grandfather Japan. probably would have been earmarked for that. Yeah, um, ab absolutely, yeah. absolutely. So, um, so we see a lot of developments. Um, as I say, um, Rabaul wasn't vital to MacArthur to head on to the Philippines. He made their own. They made their own bases as they went. Um, places like. Um, Manus Island uh, was also mm. an excellent uh, anchorage. Finchhafen was an excellent anchorage. And as they moved up the coast, Hollandia, and then up into Biak and up to uh, the Philippines, he didn't need Rabaul. As long as it was neutralised, um, they didn't need it uh, to prosecute the war. Brilliant. Well, I think we'll we'll kind of bring it to an end there. Uh, people yep. have already said what an informative episode it is, and it's great to get you back, and we will have you back again. Uh, we were talking Cheers. before we're going live, something in June possibly. But, um, yeah, it's it's yeah. great to yeah. have that That'll Australian point of view and bring these stories to a wider audience. So um, so thanks for you. So, I, as always, I recommend Philip's books. Uh, find the links and things, as always. So Hell's yeah. Battlefield, worth reading, as is D-Day. Well, Hell's in, Battlefield will tell you that story. The first chapter is called um, I'll See You in Hell, Fellas, which was the last yeah. words of one of the guys um, bayoneted at Toll. and uh, stuff. So it basically goes through the war in New Guinea and, and doesn't hold back. <laughs> Brilliant. Well, I'll just remind people what we were coming up, and I'll come back and say goodbye yeah. in a second. So, Cheers, folks, man. tomorrow we start our look at the rise of the Third Reich. So there's several shows coming up. The Vonsi show that was supposed to be on the 20, 20th didn't happen because I had an internet failure for four days. I'll try and reschedule that for a later date. But tomorrow, uh, Katia Hoyer is joining us to talk about the rise of the Third Reich. So, Katia was a German uh, living in, in Britain, wrote that fantastic book about the Second Reich. So the, the German military in a kind of the, the post-World War I or World War One and that period there. And she's going to talk about that crucial interwar period between the First World War and the Second World War and how the Third Reich rose out of that. So that'd be a fascinating insight into that kind of development there. And then more shows. We're talking about the, the, the relationship the German army had with, with alcohol, with Edward Westerman on Monday. We got shows about the, the attacks into Poland, a whole lot of shows coming your way. So as usual, stick with us, share what we're doing on social media. I, say, I, I, I re, uh, reiterate, if you just joined the channel, please click subscribe. Don't forget to click the little bell so you get notifications. And thanks for joining us. So without further uh, anything else to do, I will say good uh, good evening to you, Phil. Good morning for me. And thank everybody for watching. So um, this is Paul Woodard for World War II TV saying I will see you all again tomorrow evening for our first show in the ride of the third right cheers everybody have a good weekend bye cheers yeah